Welcome back to the Chainsaw Man Comparison Series! Now in episode 5, which covers the remainder of chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, and about half of chapter 15. We left off on quite the cliffhanger last episode, and after some b-roll, this episode wastes little time in showing us the fruits of Denji's efforts. Now as much as I'd love to show you the juicy little details in these side-by-sides, YouTube has been watching my videos like hawks lately, so there's very little I can actually show in this scene, but I will say that whoever animated this may have some sort of real life experience to back them up, because boy oh boy is this thorough. Through reaction channels and the like, I found that many people were confused as to whether Denji was actually pleased with this experience or not, and I think this is due to the fact that there are some missing elements from the manga that weren't brought over for this adaptation. Not in the way of line changes or anything, but with the absence of non-diegetic backgrounds that the manga uses frequently to portray emotion. Like I've said before, this adaptation refuses to rely on such things, and would rather focus on the the intricacies of character expressions. Most anime adaptations would be perfectly fine replicating that more uproarious sort of approach for hand-holding purposes, but I appreciate this adaptation for not bringing us into an entirely different dimension just to prove a point. No cartoony sound effects or warped character designs here, just clean-cut cinematography. The type that rewards viewers for being extra attentive. And even if discerning Denji's emotions is kinda hard to do on the spot, we get some extra time to do it while the opening plays. And when we come back, we'll continue Continue to watch the shell shock Denji go about the next day while Power gets up to some anime only shenanigans. Denji is obviously malfunctioning on some level here, but the two he lives with either don't care or simply don't notice. Makima seems to notice quite well though, as she's very alert to Denji's lack of efficiency when doing his homework. Again, I love how Mappa adapts the facial expressions in this show, not only by displaying the bothered nature of Makima, but by how it shows in the extreme close up shots that the manga doesn't always give us. It's about as in your face as Makima is getting right now, who actually knocked over a bunch of books when pulling Denji's mind out of the gutter. Seriously, this girl is a master manipulator and knows exactly how Denji's monkey brain will react to her advances. Just like the fondling scene earlier, these cuts are incredibly corporeal. It's almost as if we can feel everything that Makima is doing to Denji right now. It's so deceptively gentle, yet incredibly stirring, and that reflects well on Denji's face. And let's talk about his face for a moment, because while I've talked a lot about how facial expressions can be diminished for this adaptation, this is one of those cases where the reverse is true. They actually really push Denji Denji's character design to its limits for this section. His face is contorting in ways unlike anything that we've ever seen from the manga, and it hammers down just how much this moment had a profound impact on him. He looked downright enraptured, and if this is the sort of limit break reaction we're getting now, one can only imagine how he'll react if Makima stays true to her word about offering a free wish to him. Kind of unfortunate that we didn't get the same layout for the final illustration of chapter 12, but when you think about it, this is an impossible angle to begin with, since there should be a desk right in front of them. Denji's response to Makima's inquiry will take place on the next chapter, where he realizes what could be in store for him as long as the gun devil is defeated by him. This is no simple task though, and Makima was at least willing to admit that much. Actually, after a quick manga-only comment by Denji, she'll start going through an entire history lesson about the thing. There are some slight revisions to the Japanese grammar during her explanation, but not really enough to explore any further. The same message is told here, and it still involves one of the worst events in human history. And and it's that event that transitions us into Aki's flashback. And since this flashback happened on November the 18th, the anime corrects the TV screen by no longer showing that this feed was live. If it was, I doubt Aki's parents would be casually reading to his younger brother on the bed. In retrospect, watching this scene play out while knowing that something horrible is about to happen is pretty stomach churning. Aki didn't know that this would be the last time seeing his parents, who actually had some different final words in the manga before both Aki and his brother took off from their solitary house in the snow. No. There does seem to be more houses in the background in the manga, but little things aside, Aki's final moments with his brother were very faithful. Even if Aki doesn't say as much, he enjoyed spending time with his brother. If he didn't, then he wouldn't have agreed to continue playing with him after he got his gloves from the house. One can only hope that Aki didn't feel too responsible for saying this to his brother, because these words came from a place of love. There's no way he could have known what was about to happen, and at the very least, I'm glad that Mappa had Aki wave goodbye to his brother brother before it all happened. 
You can only imagine the sort of trauma that would cause someone at such a young age, and I'm sure there were an insane amount of others that went through similar scenarios. Interestingly, the manga actually contains some country-specific numbers as far as how many were impacted and for how long to further understand the scope of it all. But even then, the final tabulation that Makima gives us is plenty jaw-dropping enough. For that amount of death to happen globally within five minutes is an insane thing to wrap your head around, much less for those who were actually there to witness it. Quite the atrocious story Denji just heard. It likely didn't include what happened to Aki during that time, but despite understanding the sheer scope of death that this thing can unleash, I have to give respect to Denji for agreeing to set his sights on it. Again, his motives may be a tad warped, but now he's got the same goal as Aki, who as we can see has been at this goal for quite a while now, collecting pieces of the gun devil over and over again so that he can get closer to the thing that killed his family. Pretty handy that these bits can be used to figure out which devil is gun powered or not, like the devil that has apparently held himself up at a nearby hotel, killing multiple civilian devil hunters in the process. It's when the true devil hunter pros pull up that we'll end out chapter 13 and move into chapter 14 where Aki continues to baby sit his devil duo. Getting these two to capitulate is quite the annoying thing for Aki to deal with, but in the end it seems they can be house trained just like any other pet. Who would have thought some gum was all it took to win them over? Kinda surprising Aki didn't just beat the respect into them after whatever in the hell they did to him that morning. I can only imagine what a prank by devils would look like. But gum really isn't that much of an encouragement to Denji. No, he needs a little more on the spot motivation, and Himano here has just the reward in mind for this mission. Quite the surprising offer, and we already knew how Denji would react to it, but now we can start getting a little taste of how Himeno's teammates deal with their leader's carefree personality. Their dynamics are definitely a lot different from the trio we usually follow. In a past life, Denji sure as hell would have taken Himeno up on this offer, but after everything he went through with Makima, you remember that he's already got plenty to work for. Now normally I won't mention little reactionary lines that don't get brought over, but this manga only one from Aki is interesting, because without it, it's left up to interpretation as to how he takes this proclamation of Denji. He almost looks more shocked this time that someone could be so adamant about killing the gun devil. Or maybe he's just shocked that he knows Denji was referring to Makima at this point. But regardless of those proclamations, this woman has some manipulative skills of her own to exercise and decides to double down on her offer after seeing Denji's initial reaction. Sure enough, all he needed was just one little extra push. And based on this face, I think he fell for it hook, line, and sinker. This face doesn't appear at this point in the anime, rather it's held and preserved for when it comes time to animate Denji and Adai's vicious and goofy walk through the inside of the hotel. I love how Mappa animated this. It really contrasts the wild nature of Denji and the stick-up-his-butt mentality of Adai. Seems like the anime clarified that from the moment we cut to the inside of this building, they're already on the 8th floor. And since we're obviously gonna be here for a while, let's talk about the approach that Mappa took for this place. Ignoring how intentionally off-kilter these shots are framed, I think what really sells these scenes the most is the post-process lighting. Most indoor shots for any anime are CGI anyways, so baking in diffusion would logically be the next step to add that extra contrast punch to the scene. Despite how simple the floor plan of this place is, it's spruced up with textures that have just the right amount of complexity to them, and the ceiling adds a ton of extra depth on top of that. On top of the depth we usually get from the consistent borers outside of the focal point. I don't know what kind of hotel would have their ceilings exposed like this, but the divergence in lighting between it and the rest of the hallway almost gives the feeling that something could be lurking up there. Not that it bothers any of the characters, or even Kobeni for that matter, who the anime alone shows that her and Power went off to check up on the boys while they were rough housing, giving Himeno and Aki some time to chat in private about the survivability of these fresh recruits. Just Kobeni and Arai though, Aki talking about his recruits isn't in the anime since Himeno never got the chance to ask him this time, instead going right to her next question about whether Aki thinks they have a chance to live in this industry. This girl seems to be quite afraid of dealing with death, and we can kind of get a taste as to why in this upcoming flashback scene here. And what better way to aid it than with some anime exclusive crows? Seriously, Mappa loves adding these guys into their episodes. I don't blame them, they do create a nice accent to the scene, and can be used for more emotional impact as they fly with the wind once Aki introduces himself. Normally that would be followed with this mystery man giving a quick backstory on Aki, but as you already saw, he said his lines and left a little earlier in the anime, now giving the two of them some space to themselves to get acquainted with one another. It was a short acquaintance though, as it basically just starts and ends with Himeno reiterating the same line before the flashback started, perfectly looping us 
us back into the current day. A day that's starting to drag on a little too long for Denji, based off of some anime-only restless lines of his, but sure enough, right when he finishes complaining, that's when a devil is detected by Himeno, where she actually got to finish her cool little one-liner this time before this stumpy freak of nature makes his entrance. Its official and grand appearance will be what marks the end of this chapter, and once we move on to chapter 15, that's when we'll get a proper reaction to this thing in the way of some panicking from Kobeni. Looks like someone didn't get the memo that devils thrive off of that fear, because that was all the incentive this devil needed to attack her. Similar to how much closer this devil is to Kobeni now, these shots have been reframed to be far more dynamic and up close and personal. Everything is right in your face, and so much so that we can actually see the imprints on this devil once Himeno grabbed it with her ghost powers. This of course gives power the moment she's been waiting three episodes for, and boy does she love making things look as brutal as possible. Mappa certainly does enjoy animating the the insides of their devils. It's all so detailed. Much like the very easy to distinguish trail that he left behind. Mappa didn't make it overly obvious that this would come into play later since most of our focus was on Himeno here, but it was just distinct enough for us to keep in mind as we move over to the stairs. And when we're there, Power seems to be pretty interested in why Himeno would show off and explain her abilities to her, and naturally this causes Power to wonder if she has the advantage knowing all this. But even if you don't believe in ghosts, it's still probably better not to mess with them anyways. This ability really is handy. It seems like there's nothing you can do once it gets a hold of you, and Power figured that out pretty quickly on the spot. She was certainly put in her place pretty quickly, and it's a sight that the anime alone shows Denji was pretty amused by. The dynamic between these two is always so interesting to watch, but for those who exist around them, I can see how it would get kind of annoying. Kind of like how annoyed Arai is right now, with one little extra anime-only line before noticing the splatter from earlier. This is interesting, not just because the devil's head is probably missing from from Arai's vision, but that this blood stain is something that he didn't even notice at all in the manga. See, the blood is what causes him to go back and check the floor sign, but in the manga, it's instead the first thing that he looks at when he reaches the top of the stairs. While relaying these findings to the rest of his teammates, it seems that in the anime, power was still lagging behind a little bit, so that when Arai conducted his little experiment, she was still on her way up the stairs, whereas in the manga, she's already chilling with Denji once Arai reappeared from the top. Cue the visual confusion. Even though Power was just talking about steak in both versions, even she now gets the chance to notice the oddity that's occurring, whereas in the manga, she still seems to be a little out of it. And believe it or not, this panel showing Kobeni's confusion as well is the last one we'll be talking about today, because while we're only halfway through chapter 15, this is where the episode comes to a premature end. Overall, this episode was a pretty straightforward one, but one that solidified Mappa's stance on how it plans to conduct itself even when dealing with more humorous moments. They've constructed one of the more tone-consistent anime out there. It relays its emotions not by flipping the visual layout, but by subtly tweaking it like the screenplay in any other high-tier live-action show. That's the sort of thing I think the anime industry needs to explore more often, and if anything, I think the success of this show will invigorate that side of the anime medium in ways that we have yet to witness. It'll be interesting to see how MAPPA's approach will guide them through the future episodes, but for now, that'll just about do it for me. If you all like this video, then I would appreciate it if you gave the video a like, share it with a friend, and maybe get subscribed if you haven't already. And if you'd like to support me a little more, check me out on Patreon. I release all the uncensored versions of these videos on that platform. As usual, I hope you all have a fantastic day, and this is Registry, signing off.